Welcome to the clinical examination tutorial series. My name is Dr. Brian Benninger. This is a continuation of the cranial nerve examination. We will now continue with nerves 3, 4, and 6. Before we actually start that, I'd just like to let you know that whenever one examines the nervous system, or whether it's cranial or a peripheral nervous examination, the key is to stress the system. And if one doesn't stress the system, you're not going to get value for money and you will miss subtle signs. So with cranial nerves 3, the ocular motor, 4, the trochlear, and 6, the abducens nerves, these have to do with moving the globe or the eyeball within the orbit. And so these have to do with movement of the eye itself. And for this, we classically talk about creating an H pattern, the pattern of an H. So most people would sit in here like this and create a very narrow, tight H, okay? And I have a problem with this because this will not pick up anything terribly subtle, okay? It's going to be a small, tight H. Those eyes aren't going to do a whole lot of movement. And what you want to do is, is pick up those subtle things. Anything that's terribly obvious, you're going to pick up on just general examination. However, with this, you need to stress the system. So what I like to do is start with my left, and I would start in the midline and about the equator, about the level of the eyes. Ask the person just to follow your finger. Come straight out, straight out. Keep going as far as you can go. And then go up high into the top corner up here watching those eyes, really working those eye muscles, come down to the lower portion here, come back to the equator of the midline, and then switch hands, because you will be staring straight on at the uh, patient, and then use your opposite hand, go to the far side with an equator or the bar of the H, go all the way to the top, and then come right down to the bottom, bring it back to the midline and stop there, and you will pick up subtleties. If you're fatiguing muscles in myasthenia gravis, that you will start to see that. You will be able to see obvious nystagmus and whether it's vertical or horizontal. These things will become much more obvious if you stress the system. So for cranial nerves numbers three, four, and six, ocular motor, trochlear, and abducens, one wants to stress the system and create the large H, okay? Now, from there we will move on to the cranial nerves number five and number seven. Number five is the trigeminal nerve. And the trigeminal nerve is a predominant sensory cutaneous nerve and with some unique motor aspect to it. To start off, what we want to do, and this is again a very important technique, is we know that the trigeminal nerve has the three parts, an ophthalmic, a maxillary, and a mandibular portion where nerves come out to innervate these three classic regions on our face. All right, one of the things that people often do is they'll put their fingers, their fingertips, and they'll touch both sides here and they will pull to the side like this. What that does, in my opinion, is the quality and the way that my fingertip is, my, uh, the oiliness and the, the, the texture of my finger is going to be different than every patient that I see and vice versa. And so if I'm to press, and I might press differently, and if I pull, I'm actually stretching skin. And so from that point of view, if I said, does it feel the same on both sides? It would be very difficult for a patient, especially a very competitive patient, to say, well, perhaps the right is a wee bit different than the left, okay? But you're not getting a very accurate uh, statement there. So what I recommend is to use the back of the nail. So it doesn't really matter the, uh, the type of skin that you're examining, whether it's terribly oily, terribly dry, or anything in between. You use the back of the nails, and you sweep across in this manner. And I always do it twice. The first time, almost so that they can get a feel of what I'm doing, and the second time is when you actually ask them, does it feel the same on both sides? You, you don't say is one completely absent of sensation. That would be terribly rare, but there can be differences. And so one wants to start off by saying, does it feel the same on both sides? Yes. And then you would come down and do the maxillary portion. Yes. And then start here in the mandibular portion. Okay, and again, using the back of your nails, so therefore there's no pulling on the skin and differences. Now, I'd like to just talk about briefly, we know generically that this would be V1 is the ophthalmic, and this is the maxillary and the mandibular. Again, one of the problems is when we examine, we tend to just go a short distance, maybe to the edge of the, where the eyebrows finish right here, and then our hands slide away. Don't forget that, you know, people, their head continues going around in a contour. So what one wants to do is actually follow it around, and I like to come right past and close to the ears. Now with that in mind, you have to raise your level of understanding about the nervous innovation. From the first part, until we probably get right to the angle, right where the eyes would finish right here, we're truly doing the supratrochlear and the supraorbital coming across here. Those two nerves are part of V1, okay? 
But if I continue around here, as soon as I get in this area right in here, the start of that temporal region, one almost certainly is getting the zygomatical temporal nerve, which is part of V2. And then if I continue and go right up close to the ear, I'm now actually getting the temporal part of auricular temporal. So really, with this particular examination, if I go all the way around, I'm actually doing V1, now V2, and then now V3. Okay, So we're actually doing V1, V2, V3 if we're being totally comprehensive. But if we were to stop right here, that clearly would be V1. Okay, But when you do the examination, maximize your opportunity to go all the way to the ear to figure out where the subtlety would be. When one comes down to here, clearly at the start, this is all going to be V2, but it'll be the infraorbital nerve. We will then have a buccal nerve in here. Again, that will be part of V3. And so remember that, again, this is V2, but then some area, some part of this could be V3 from the buccal nerve. Initially, infraorbital, a bit of buccal, finishing off by the ear there. When we get down to the mandible, we would then go and do, obviously the mandible would be the mental nerve coming in through here, perhaps a little bit of buccal as you go back, and you would finish off there. And that would be those three nerves, and that would be the sensory component of the trigeminal, okay? Now the motor component of the trigeminal, we use muscles of mastication. Initially, you want to assess any type of muscles with power, with gravity and against gravity. So I just ask the patient to go ahead, open and close your mouth. Now by closing it, quite simply, I know that she can work her muscles or her mandible against gravity, so I know that she's at least at a three out of five on that type of scale. From there, I would ask the person to waggle their chin from side to side. Then I know particular muscles such as the pterygoid, medial and lateral pterygoids are functioning. And then I would ask to assess a little bit more there as far as the strength of these muscles. I generally ask them to go ahead and I put my hand on the top of the head here, ask them to open the mouth and then go ever so gently so you don't collapse the teeth together to create some sort of a fracture, but actually say, I'm going to give me some resistance. Don't let me close your mouth. Don't let me close your mouth. Okay. And if you have an element of resistance, you can easily go to a four or five out of five right there. Now, again, one of the techniques that I think might be um, difficult to assess is if you have them close their mouth, put your hand right here and then say, open it against this resistance. That can be very tricky, especially in the elderly. I think it's much better to have them open it and then gently see how much you can close it. And so that would assess the motor part. The last bit on that is sometimes you can put your hand on one side and say, press against it with your open mouth. Okay, and opposite side, move your, okay. So you're just assessing where there's movement from side to side there, okay? Now, that would be the trigeminal completed there. Facial nerve. The facial nerve is a motor nerve, a very strong dominant motor nerve for the muscles of facial expression. With that, you start off, and I like to give the example to the patient. If you ask them to furl their brow, show them and do it for them, and then ask them to repeat it. Okay. Then I ask them to screw their eyes up tight, and I show them what I mean by that, so screw your eyes up tight. And then I say, don't let me open them. So they close it tight, and then you try to pry it open, you say, thanks very much. There are some people that might have damage to one of the facial nerves that would come up, maybe do the orbital part of the orbicularis oculi, but perhaps the palpebral part isn't as well stimulated or a different nerve got damaged there. You may be able to open those up quite easily and therefore index a suspicion that there is injury to part of the facial nerve because of the crossover of what's going on with the facial nerves. Now, once I've done that, I would then ask them to blow their cheeks out don't let me push them in. Okay, very good. So there's some resistance there and able to maintain that. Okay, then I'd ask the patient to smile. Okay, show your teeth. Very good. Sometimes they can smile and have a problem, but if they have to show their teeth, it's more control about those muscles around the mouth. And so that part is very good. And then that would control, if you like, part of buccal, part of the marginal mandibular nerve. And then as we went down to the very last nerve, or the nerve coming in theory, the cervical nerve or cervical nerve, one would ask them to make like a frog's neck. Go ahead, there you go, jolly good. And so then you know that the platysma is being stimulated. And therefore, those five classic branches, that being the temporal going to the frontalis. Remember, the temporal isn't going straight up vertically. It's coming over to the frontalis and then often giving off branches towards the orbit region. Then you have the zygomatic nerve, again, maybe helping with the frontalis, certainly covering this region around the orbit of the eye. And then one has the buckle coming centrally over here, giving help above and below towards the equator of the mouth. And then we have the marginal mandibular coming along here. Again, working some of the muscles down in the lower part of the face here. And then lastly, that cervical one coming down into the neck and helping with that platysma in its stimulation. That will conclude those cranial nerves. Thanks very much.